pet view a catastrophe. But from a proper perspective, it just contributes to global harmony. Well, I would like to see that global harmony to, to which Auschwitz and Gulag uh, contribute. For me, for example, among other things, the meaning of crucifixion is precisely that God, as Hegel put it, God, which is that transcendent, God, what dies on the cross is not a messenger of God. It's God himself. In the sense of crucifixion means you no longer can evoke a transcendent God which somehow guarantees that. In other words, the message of crucifixion is Auschwitz is a catastrophe for God also. God is not allowed to withdraw into this hate from which he can say, don't worry, withdraw, you will see the global harmony, good vibrations reverberating in this disharmony or whatever. Let me go on. Uh, but now probably you will tell me an obvious counter-argument. But when I was in the movie theater watching this film, I didn't perceive this theological dimension. It must be very implicit. Is it really there? So I agree. Probably you were not fully aware. That's the point. At what level, then, does this implicit ideology, theological justification function? Here, out of professional solidarity, I would like to refer to a colleague, American philosopher, who unfortunately, in a tragic accident, lost his job a week ago, to a, something evil is coming, you can guess, to a well-known philosopher specialized in the relationship between what we know and what we don't know. Of course, Donald Rumsfeld. I thought you would. Okay. You, <laughs> I'm here referring to his well-known interview in September, sorry, in March 2003, where he said, there are known knowns, things we know that we know. There are known unknowns, things we know that we don't know. For example, I know that there are cars outside this building in a parking lot, but I don't know how many they are. And I know that I don't know this. And then, as he put it, the unknown unknowns. Things which are so radically unknown, they are simply another dimension that we even don't know that we don't know them. And this is the limit of American philosophy today. <laughs> this is why you are in deep shit in Iraq. The fourth term is missing, if you noticed it, no? That is to say, known knowns, known unknowns, you know what you don't know, unknown unknowns, totally other. Why not the most interesting category, unknown knowns? Things you know, but you don't know that you know them. That's ideology. At this level, I claim theology is in those films, is in those two films. It is all that, let's call them unconscious prejudices or whatever, that we don't even, that we don't know that we know, but nonetheless, they are operative. This is how our beliefs today function. And here, okay, I will try to, not to be too long, but here, uh, this attitude of unknown knowns, I think, provides the key to how ideology today functions. Of course, at the level of our explicit knowledge, we are cynics today, usually. No, you don't take it seriously. I don't believe whatever. I just want to realize my ego, whatever, for pleasure, whatever. But I claim we believe much more, but not we in the depth of our souls. We practice, we materialize our beliefs. The best key to this predicament is for me, maybe some of you know it, I quote it in my parallax view, this wonderful anecdote about Niels Bohr, the quantum physics guy. It's an anecdote I found in a biography of Bohr where he was visited at his countryside wooden cottage house by a fellow scientist, and this fellow scientist noticed something strange, that above the entrance to the house, entrance door, there was a horseshoe. In Europe, this is kind of a superstitious prop item. The idea is that it prevents evil spirits, whatever evil, to enter the house. So the friend asked Niels Bohr, my God, I thought you were a scientist. Do you believe in it? Why do you have this there? I, uh, Bohr gave a perfect answer. Of course, I don't believe in it. But I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> this is how ideology works today. You don't have to... You don't have to believe in it, as it were, your practice. You just practice belief, which is why we can be cynical as much as you want, but there always is a belief embodied 
either in what you do or also a very interesting phenomenon. In you transpose belief onto another, as Lacan would have put it, the big other beliefs. Now let me give you two examples on this, which are one of, no, maybe even not both of them are known to you, from two opposite systems, Hollywood and Stalinism. Hollywood. You saw Hitchcock's, I hope you know it by heart, Hitchcock's Vertigo. You know that scene uh, after 40 minutes into film, I think, after first fake suicide attempt of Madeleine, she jumps into the water there, I mean, uh, beneath uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Scotty brings her home, and uh, then there is a long panning shot. Scotty is room, then camera moves diagonally. First it shows kitchen sink, and above it, her underwear, her clothes. Of course, he undressed her and put her into bed, and then slowly it moves the camera towards the door, his bedroom, of his bedroom where she is. Now, that's the logic. But now do something if you have the film on DVD. Put it on freeze when it is showing the underwear above the kitchen sink, no, hanging. You will see that there is no underwear. It's just abstract pieces of cloth, towels, and so on. Why? I read it in a book on Vertigo, in a French one. It's incredible. Hayes Code blocked it, no? They said, no, if you really see the underwear, this would have been a material proof that within the logic of the narrative, uh, <coughs> Scotty saw Kim Novak naked. No, we won't allow this. <laughs> now, isn't there something <coughs> strange about this? Because ask yourself a simple question. Whom were the Hays Code censors trying to protect? Not us. Every spectator, normal spectator, automatically, on the contrary, automatically assumes that what he or she sees is, uh, is the underwear. So it is as if another objectified, virtual gaze is presupposed. In Lacanian terms, this phantasmatic gaze of the big other, and that gaze, which can be eventually in our life, lives uh, perceived as the gaze of children, of the leader, the innocence of this gaze should be protected. Now, let's jump for another, I think, even nicer example in Stalinism. 53. You know, the great leader died. Okay. Then, uh, at that very point, the first volume of Soviet encyclopedia appeared. I don't know which edition. The point is there were, of course, among other things, two pages on Lavrenti Derya, you know, KGB, Stalin's henchman, and so on. Uh, and it was like, this was, were basically two pages, one leaf. First, a little bit of the preceding article, the Biberia on the next side, and then, okay. The problem was that then, as befits Stalinism, half a year later, in the fall or in summer, Beria was unfortunately discovered to be an English spy shot and so on. Okay, the, became a non-person. So what happened? Something absolutely breathtaking, which tells us a lot about the functioning of social order. Every subscriber of Encyclopedia got a letter with a new page. He was asked to cut out the old page sent it and stuck in the new page. And they took care that the continuity was perfect. That is to say, first it was the end of the previous article entry. Then, you know, it's nice what they did with photos. Instead of bear, B-E-R, they put bearing, bearing pass, you know, between Alaska and uh, Siberia. But, and so that, you know, you put it in and the continuity was perfect, seamless. Again. The same enigma. Whom were they trying to deceive? Of course, not the people. The people knew it. They had to do it. <laughs> so, again, you have kind of a, almost like in the medieval times, a proof of the existence of God, a proof of the presupposed existence of the big other. No? That's the mystery of Stalinism for me. How? The most brutal regime, killing people ruthlessly, whatever. At the same time, Total panic, incredibly sensitive for appearances. As if to disturb an appearance, everything falls apart. Again, this is how beliefs function. Now, let's go on. Of course, what this means is that we never, this, what this means is I claim that we never believe. Even if you have a fully religious person, if he were to really experience God, it would have been an absolute shock for him, I claim. 
It's a kind of a, when we believe, it's always a minimally virtual belief, which is why, for example, 